he showed me one day we were we were at this law office in 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 LA and he showed me the internet and it was like anything you could think of like it was it was clear that there was a huge shift coming and a huge opportunity people were losing their jobs left and right the pastime for most of the startup employees at the time was reading a fucked company it was this popular website put on by this guy pud and basically it was a place where all of the startup employees when they would get shit canned could go on and just just talk smack and we went we were sitting in the board and they had like this head negotiator that they brought in and his opening offer was so good but he had his two proteges with him and so we knew we couldn't really just accept it we had to be like well we, we better go and, and think about it remember to remember to move remember to breathe uh, remember to surround yourself with loved ones so i was thinking that uh we should probably start off by introducing your beanbag chair on the podcast okay Pete, <laughs> introduce yourself and introduce your uh the story of the beanbag chair my name is uh pete mccarthy uh, i'm a product manager at matter product studio and behind me is my newest addition to my office my giant beanbag chair uh, which my partner who is a buy nothing wizard on facebook got for me for free last week and it actually matches my lamp and my chair that i'm sitting on here and it was brand quite, new quite serendipitous right it's it's always good when the free beanbag chair that shows up at your house matches your lamp in your your desk chair <laughs> so I mean, we lived in san francisco for many years and there buy nothing and getting stuff for free was just like commonplace and somehow my partner has managed to extend that to a small town of 1500 people in Colorado. So carry it forward. You mentioned San Francisco. You also have quite the storied tech history and entrepreneurial history. So why don't we just start with who is Pete? What's your story? And what are you doing today? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, I mean, if we're talking about San Francisco and Kind of relates to how I got started in technology. Uh, I'm I'm a California native. Grew up in in San Diego. Went to school in uh, Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara, and uh, graduated Santa Barbara for, in economics. Um, just because I just I just like systems like that and like sort of the combination of systems and philosophy, mathematics, uh, economics is. Um, but I uh, graduated in 96 and I had, I've always been an entrepreneur. I owned, when I was going to school, I owned a, a coffee shop called Java Jones with, uh, with a business partner of mine. Uh, we had actually parlayed that from a mobile, uh, mobile car wash business. And when I was doing the mobile car wash business, I contracted with one of my friends who was a computer programmer at the time to build a little app that would track all of our car washes and fax out these sheets. And it was kind of this complicated thing. But um, because of that, I, I had this relationship with this programmer who I was, he was, he had an internship at a law office in LA. And he showed me one day, we were, we were at this law office in, in, in LA. And he showed me the internet on like super fast, high speed, like a high speed connection to the internet. This is like back and when was this? Were, 1995, 1995 and he showed me the mosaic web browser and it was like i was like this is well this is like gonna be huge like this there's gonna be like websites for we at the time we did this mobile car wash business we we had all of these wineries as as businesses and i was thinking all these wineries are gonna want websites and it was like anything you could think of like it was it was clear that there was like this was like a huge shift coming and a huge opportunity and also just kind of fascinating. And I just started diving into what, you know, what the World Wide web was and HTML and like all, all of these things. And like, it was just this like brain exploding moment. Um, for what was me. the so first, that, what was the first website that you saw or the first website that you remember where, because it's yeah. going from the world, right? The normal world and then seeing the internet for the first time, at that time, when it was not the thing that we know it to be today, what was that? Was it, oh, I immediately get this and this is going to be the next big, this is going to be a big thing? Or was it, 
this is a brand new, my brain's exploding. I don't even know how to kind of frame this in my mind. Yeah. Like it's gotta be a big mental shift to understand what the internet is. For the I, first time. I don't remember what the very first website was. It was probably sports or, or, or something along those lines, but it re was really just like information with hyperlinks to other information. And this was a time when you had to do, if you had to do research, you were going to the library and looking, look, they had a computer system to look things up, but you know, it, you still had to go find a book and then find the reference and, and, and all these things. You didn't have like information just at your fingertips like that, unless you had a CD-ROM, which was like the, the encyclopedia that was on the CD-ROM or things like that. But just, it, it became really apparent that anybody could build a website and anybody could link and link to another thing. And it, it was like, every business is going to want, want this. It's going to be, it's going to be kind of central to its identity and how it operates. That's awesome. All right. So, so you see mosaic, you say, okay, everyone's going to want a website. It's 1995. Continue. Okay. So, so then I became a tour guide. <laughs> <laughs> So I decided when I graduated in 96, I, I sort of, I had been going through my entrepreneurial phase. I had my coffee house. I was, this was, I, I, I bought this, my partner and I were, we were partners in the car wash business and we actually bought a coffee house thinking we were going to start a mobile coffee business called the jumping bean. I've always been really, was always naming, really excited about naming things, not so much about doing the work to actually launch the mobile coffee business. So we got into, we bought a coffee house that was for sale. It was one of our customers that we were detailing his car and he owned this coffee house and he wanted to sell it. And so we bought it and we immediately kind of dropped the mobile business and just kind of fell in love with like owning a cafe in a college town. This was in Isla Vista. It's still there, by the way, Java Jones. And uh, neither of us wanted to go off and do the mobile business anymore because we were like having too much fun hanging out at the coffee house. And I was really on this like sort of Alex P. Keaton entrepreneur doing my thing. And one day, one of my friends who had worked as an employee for me at the car wash business came and was like, I, uh, I need a reference and I want you to be a reference for me. And I was like, oh, great. Sure. What, what is it? And he was going to be a tour guide. And he told me about this job where it's called Trek America. You take passengers like you have like. 10 to 12 passengers, all none of them Americans, all from all over the world, all between the ages of about 20 and 30, usually a mix of four or five nationalities. And you go on anywhere from two to two week trips to three month trips all over North America. And I was like, people will pay you to do that, you know? And he was like, yeah, you should do it too. And I was like, oh, I can't do it. I got my my coffee, my coffee shop business and, and all these things. And he was just like, dude, you're, you're, 22 years old like if you don't do it now like when are you gonna do it and and i i really kind of took it to heart and i just like i made this huge shift i sold the business to my partner i took like 18 credits to like finish school i took a year off i moved back to san diego for like nine months you had to be 23 to be the tour guide and i i basically um uh, I, I just waited, went to Europe for like for three months and backpacked around. And then I came back and I basically worked as a tour guide for three years doing basically adventure travel trips all over North America. So so talk me through how Pete makes decisions, because we didn't even talk about how you started the mobile car wash business. Right. So <laughs> somehow you start a business right in college or even before college. Then you say, yeah. oh, mobile coffee shop. Mobile, that sounds great. Let me sell this, buy this. I'm a coffee barista owner guy now. Oh, the internet. This is going to be so amazing. This is so incredible. Oh, by the way, I'm going to now do this random tour guide thing. Like, what is the through line for your decision-making process and all that? I mean, I think some of it was, well, I, I definitely have always enjoyed, like, taking on new challenges. So even, like, in software, I uh, as we kind of go through this, you'll see there's, like, totally different industries. And I kind of love jumping into that with beginner's mind and just kind of embracing that. And sometimes I also like, I, I questioned my own judgment. So I was like, it, it was clear that the web was going to take off. This was going to be awesome, but that was always going to be there. And here came this opportunity came along and it was just the serendipity of it. And like, it just sounded so awesome. 
not like something I would typically do, but it just presented itself. So I just, I just grabbed it and did it. Um, Don't so take yeah. serendipity for granted. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, you know, so it's like, it, I mean, even if it doesn't turn out right, it's fun. It's fun to just kind of sometimes go down different, different paths and, and learn and, and do these different things. So yeah, the Trek America, I, I, it was one of the best things I ever did. It was so fun. I spent three seasons doing that. I did trips all over North America, all the way up to Alaska, all the way down to Guatemala. I spent over a year just in Mexico alone, which I loved. I, uh, I met my, my, my now ex-wife, um, you know, um, doing trips. She was one of my passengers. Um, it just opened up a lot of experiences and met friends from all over the world that I still have and keep in contact with. Um, and while I was doing it, the internet boom was like taking off. And a lot of my friends who had gone to school with in Santa Barbara had moved up to San Francisco and they were like consulting and doing like, just, just, you know, it was, you could tell it was just like, Go craziness going on and I, I didn't regret it at all because they, they'd be like you know doing something and I'd be like oh yeah I'm in I'm in New Orleans or I'm at the Grand Canyon or you know so it was like things that I would never have experienced it would have taken me years and years of travel to experience and I got to I got to go and experience all of that and get paid while I was doing it so I, but in 99, I was getting like three years into that. And I was like, you know, it's enough being a tour guide. Like you're always meeting new people, but you're always having to reintroduce yourself, tell your story. And it was like time to kind of settle down. And I, that's when I, I had met, I had met my, um, my now ex-wife, but um, decided to um, just w move to San Francisco. And I moved up to San Francisco, rented a room from uh from one of my uh, friend's parents who had a house in half moon bay and within a week i had a job at open table and i was one of their earliest how, how, yeah. how did that happen right so again why san francisco was it again this lure of tech were their friends pulling you and then once yeah. you get there okay seven days later you have a job like what what <laughs> What is that? You're a tour guide that's been on the road for three months and yeah. then you're being hired at a tech startup? Um, it, I mean, it wasn't quite that seamless. I spent like I spent like three or four months in, in San Diego while I was transitioning. And then, then I went up to San Francisco, but uh, like right after I got off the road. But um, I, I went up to San Francisco, basically had a place to stay. And, um, you know, at that time, it was much harder to find a place in San Francisco than it was to actually find a job. This was like very end of 99, beginning of, of, of 2000. And I mean, it was, um, the bubble, there were, right? it, it was the, right. the height of the dot com bubble, like completely. And why San Francisco? I mean, it was partly that, but I also, having grown up in California, San Francisco was one of the first big cities that I ever really visited in my life. I don't count LA as a city. It's more of a sprawl. And um, I always loved it. I loved the feel of it. I loved how people were different, culture, just everything about it. So it was always a dream of mine to live in San Francisco. And so it was kind of the convergence of all those things. And uh, Open Table, I had worked restaurants my whole, from when I was about 14, uh, started in a deli, worked in like table service restaurants where I was like a busser, you know, with crumbing tables and the whole fine dining and all that kind of stuff. So I understood restaurants really well. And I, you know, I just had, I just knew I had an aptitude. So Open Table had an opening in their call center. And I was like, I'll just get in there and like figure out the business. And that's basically what happened. And uh, they were really, it was like, I worked the night shift in their call center, which was usually really dead. And so I started just digging into um, MCSE books and, under, you know, learning, le what learning. Are and my, MCSE is like Microsoft certifications. Like back then, like all the open table stuff ran on, you know, NT 4.0. And it was, you know, so in, in a lot of a lot of it, a lot of the job was we were like the first people to install a DSL line into a restaurant. And so you'd have to configure a router and off, oftentimes the problems were the routers. And we had like four different DSL companies go out of business during this time. There was like all these telecom bankruptcies. And so we were constantly switching out routers and I'd be on the phone and I'd have these like things to go through 
but I wouldn't necessarily understand what all that was. What's a subnet? What's what's an IP address? What you know? And so I would I was just like, okay, I have time, so I'll just start learning all this stuff. And then at the same time, a lot of the engineers would be in like across the room, and I would just go over and start talking to them and seeing what was going on and start kind of giving them feedback of when, when calls were coming in and I was talking to restaurants and they, they would just incorporate that right into the software. So it was like my first product job where I was. Like, and, and really so this it. is, this is what 99, 2000, uh, height of the dot com bubble. You also said you were one of the first employees there. So first, what first, does it I was one like? of the first 20 employees there. First 20. That's mm -hmm. still obviously quite early. So, yeah. um, what what I mean, what does Silicon Valley look like? What does San Francisco look like in '99, in 2000? Is it crazy parties? Is it everyone knows in their bubble, or is it we're just going to the moon? We're all going to be rich. Like, what's the sentiment? Like, put I mean, I don't I don't have a reference for San Francisco before this because I literally arrived in the middle of this. Uh, I mean, I had spent some time up there in college, but um, Open Table was we were right in the Mission District. We were like on. We were like 17th in mission. Um, we were in this old, what had been a, a, a building that was used like for seamstresses and, and things like that, but they had cleared out. It was like this giant loft space. We had the foosball tables. We had like the refrigerator packed with every kind of beer and the Slim Jims and the snacks. And like, it was, it, it was like a parody of a startup like sitcom. With, with everything like, that you think it is. Everything. Yeah. And they were hiring. They opened up like 20 offices in like six months because there was another, I, I want to, I, I don't even remember the name that was like easy res or something, which was like the, our East coast competitor that was based in Boston, the Boston tech company. And they were getting funded by Boston VCs and we were getting funded by all the San Francisco and we were competing. And for a long time we were kind of neck and neck. And so it was like all about growth, hiring engineers, you know, I mean, it was, like for like six months and then immediately after that it was all winding back down so it was like we were closing all the offices there were just like expensive routers and switches like sitting on the desk and tell telecom equipment because back then it was like every all of our servers ran in the building it wasn't like there wasn't cloud right it was like there was a server room and that was the server room for open table right there, right, you know, next to us and all the switches and everything was was routed locally. So yeah, so it was like this huge r meteoric rise, even to with the with the the startup drama, the founders got re the VCs replaced the founders with like the, you know, the adults in the room who were uh, the C who had previously been the CEO of Micros Fidelio. So like a big a hospitality software company and they were like now we're going to transition you to being you know real you know serious company and this guy came in right as the dot com like the floor was falling out he managed to raise 70 million dollars even with the writing on the wall and which be which is the only reason open table survived they they then slashed almost everybody they probably laid off 80 percent of everyone and uh I was, you know, I, I was in the main office and at that, at that point I had gotten promoted to doing implementation and I became basically the person who went out to all the restaurants and installed open table. So I got to know like Thomas Keller uh, from the French laundry. I like, I, I knew all the restaurant tours in San Francisco. I would do a little side work for them and, and like hook them up with pirated software and they'd give me like free wine flights and, and, and three course dinners and stuff what, like that. What software were they, were, were they stealing? Oh, like all the Microsoft, you know, like all the Microsoft stuff and yeah, just any, anything they wanted, like anything they were, you know, like Outlook and, and stuff like that. Cause at the time it was like all that stuff you, you had to, you had to buy, right. There was like, if you wanted to run an email, you had to buy something um, or have the serial numbers for the, for the software. And what, what was the sentiment with like friends and just the city in general? Was it, oh, we're all doomed and software is dead or the internet is dead? I mean, so meteoric rise, everyone's, you know, yeah. got to yeah. outspend our competition, got to outraise our competition, go, 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 go. Oh shit, the world's ending. Like describe the mood of the city of the friends of people, like were people losing their jobs left and right? And People were losing their jobs left and right. 
Um, they, the, the sort of the, the pastime for the open table employees and probably most of the startup employees at the time was reading, uh, uh, fucked company. Have you ever heard of fucked company? It was this popular website put on by this guy, Pud. And basically it was a place where all of the startup employees, when they would get shit canned could go on and just, just talk smack about their company and post any gossip and stuff like that. And actually one day, one person got fired at our work because it was like open on his computer and we were like forbidden to be on fuck company, but it was like basically the, the water cooler for, I'm pretty, I'm sure you can find archives of it. It's, it's, it's pretty hilarious. That's awesome. um, the guy who started it actually ended up, went on to do a bunch of different, like very impressive startups and things like that. But um, yeah. It's uh, uh, that was definitely part of the whole, the, the startup story, but in San Francisco, I mean, it was like it, the bottom fell out. So all of a sudden you could find apartments to rent when you couldn't find anything. People were, there was a net exodus from the city. Um, but the silver lining was that all these startups were like selling computer gear for like nothing. So a lot of startups kind of came out of that period like a lot of engineers were sent home and they like basically got to work and built things. And so really within like three or four years after that, you already had this resurgence. And I would say to me, I stayed at open table for a couple more years. So I was sort of secure in that time. Uh, but one of the engineers from open table, who was the first engineer left and he started working for a restaurant group in San Francisco, building a full point of sale system with a reservation system. And, uh, when they finally launched that, I was the person, the installation person who went out to get their open table unit. And he walked me upstairs and he showed me what he was working on. And I went and became their second employee. It was called smart restaurant solutions. So, uh, I helped start, start that, um, we were moderately successful. We were kind of banking on that open table would go out of business and then we'd be there to really like clean up which didn't happen, but uh, we had like a, 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 a okay exit. We were bought by a, a private equity fund out of Las Vegas. So you went from tour guide to mm-hmm. overnight call center, dealing with restaurants and customers to mm-hmm. jump on over the line to talk to the engineers and giving them a feedback, elevated to kind of, you know, implementation, going out meeting the relationship with the restaurants, hiring software, doing all that. And then one day you're doing that, you end up meeting up. I, did you know the person? I did. Yeah. Did you know that? So, so you, you see an old friend, he's working on something new, you go there. Mm-hmm. What were you doing at that company? Um, were you, were you now officially in product? Was product even a thing then? Like, or what were my, you doing? My, my t- product was a product was a thing. There were people that did product. It tended to be more on the marketing side, I would say. Um, I, I, that was really my first time where I think I would, I, even though that my title was VP of operations. I mean, I like, I basically, we only grew to at most, I think six employees, but uh, you know, I set up our email, I set up our website, our, I was like, I kind of did it all. And Matt and I actually worked above our pilot restaurant and, uh, and I would sit across from him and we were in the, their, their, their office where other, re- the other restaurant employees were. And so I, you know, we would update the software and run down and we'd see them working on it and see how it would work. And then I'd run up and tell Matt, oh, here's what's going on and, you know, change that. We didn't have any like official scrums or things. It was just two guys, right? Building software. Solving problems. Solving problems. Yeah. And it was a ton of fun. And we worked above the restaurant and like we had, it was a Vietnamese. It was like this very fine dining Vietnamese, one of the first Vietnamese restaurants in San Francisco. So we had all the... uh Vietnamese coffees we wanted and, uh, and they served their specialty was drunken crab. So we had all the drunken crab and garlic noodles and it was, uh, it was a pretty sweet gig. It was fun. What, what more could you want out of, uh, your next startup than unlimited drunken crab and Vietnamese noodles and <laughs> yeah, right. sitting <laughs> right above your user that's using your software that you're iterating on. That's, that's kind of yeah. a, a product dream, right? It was great. We, we, our big success was we sold our reservation system to Maggiano's, which at the time Maggiano's is like an Italian restaurant, but they're owned by Brinker, which is 
basically the company that owns and runs Chili's. That's like their main, their big restaurant. And we went, the two of us went to sell um, our solution to, to, to Brinker. And we were sitting at the, they, they brought us into, we had already piloted. I had, we had signed up a deal with them to pilot at like four of their restaurants. And I went around and installed it at all the places. And then we came back and they wanted to buy it for, they decided that it, it had worked and they wanted to buy it for all of them. And we went, we were sitting in the board and they had like this head negotiator that they brought in and he had two of his protégés and he gave us this deal that was like so much better. I, I, the, the, I don't know exactly the numbers, but I want to say it was like $10,000 for like, like a flat license front licensing plus an annual fee Plus they were gonna they were gonna give us like seven thousand dollars per install, and we figured out I could just fly around and install a thing. And his opening offer was so good, but he had his two proteges with him, and so we knew we couldn't really just accept it. We had to be like, well, we, we better go and, and think about it. And so we like up the ante. You didn't, you didn't want to make him look bad in front of his proteges. <laughs> yeah. We were like we were like going to be happy with like half of what they were giving us. And, uh, and even like they had every time they had offered, like come out to our off, you know, our, our offices and stuff, we'd be like, oh, we'll come to Dallas. And, uh, you know, cause it was like, our office was like above a, a little restaurant and a thing. It was so, yeah. So that was like our, and then we ended up, I, I never, I mean, that was one of the, neither Matt or I had controlling interest of that company. It was, we were being, we were not bootstrapped. They paid us a, sal a very good salary the entire time. But ultimately that kind of bit us in the ass because we didn't have total control of what we wanted to do. And we ended up, they ended up selling to this investment group out of Las Vegas, who was also funding their restaurant expansions. And before I knew it, I was flying out to Vegas every, like basically every other week and they wanted me to move to Vegas and I wasn't going to do that. And so I then took a job in like, I, I, I transitioned, this was like my first actual product job. Uh, I, I took a job for a company called PAR, which is like a point of sale company. They built the original point of sale for McDonald's. They're based in upstate New York. And I took a job as their, as a product manager for them, uh, for both, they were kind of uh, doing mobile and, and point of, the restaurant point of sale. And this was like point of sale for really for quick service restaurants. Um, and you know, took the paycheck for a while. It was okay. A little bit uninspiring, but this, the CEO personally like hired me and wanted me to come in as a, as like a change agent. So that's what I was there to, to do that. Um, I worked remote. This was like, I started, you know, I was working remote starting in like 2000, gosh, this would have been 2000, about four. And I really didn't like it. I mean, I had to travel everywhere I needed to go, get on, go to the East Coast. But um, I did that for, I basically did a variation of that, went to, to one of their competitors for pretty much the next eight years um, and then decided to launch my own. Uh, this is the, I, when the iPhone came out, I, I quickly realized that like we could do some, some things on mobile, like, like sort of for the enterprise that at the time, everything in enterprise was like on these big clunky, you know, windows CE really terrible to build anything on it. Um, and then all of a sudden the iPhone came out and I, I immediately was like, got into like jailbreaking and how you could want, you know, put your own apps and things on that. And I was like telling my company, I'm like, we just need to be focused on building things on, on iOS. Oh, and also I had gone to a, a meetup in, in Oakland and was introduced to Amazon cloud really, really early. And so kind of, so, I mean, the, both, both of those are obviously like very big shifts in technology, cloud mm -hmm. and, and mobile, right? Because at that time you had what the Blackberry was king, right? And so Blackberry is QWERTY keyboard, small screen, it's email enabled, but not really web enabled. And so yeah. if you go from that to a touch device, beautiful screen, what, what was the click for you? Again, you talk about seeing Mosaic for the first time, you seeing the internet truly in the first yeah. time, and then kind of going through this journey, seeing the, the rise and fall of, or maybe not the rise, but the dot com bubble burst, you're transitioning yeah. more and more to tech, you've kind of built software along the way. What was seeing 
the iPhone, seeing that opportunity, like, like what was your inflection point? What did you think about the future of technology when seeing it? I mean, I, I was in line to buy the first iPhone. Like I, like I was like hook, line and sinker. I mean, I, I had been a Mac, like when I went to work at enterprise, I was the guy with the white MacBook where and like the plastic out MacBooks. A way, and even figured out a way how to use, uh, G, I, I would like forward stuff to my Gmail and I could use my Gmail for my email and not use the Outlook and not use the calendar and like not use any of that stuff. So I was already contrarian. On... Oh yeah. And I remember like talking to our CIO and our CEO and I was like, Oh, Google and Apple are going to like just crush Microsoft. And of course we were like a micro, we were like a, a bronze or gold titanium sponsored Microsoft, all of the, you know, all the corporate sales enterprise stuff for Microsoft. I mean, we were hook, line, and sinker. Everything Microsoft, and all of our development Microsoft. And I was Did the people guy. Think you were crazy. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I was the guy pushing, pushing for uh, Ruby on Rails. I had started to. I, I had always like. I, I wasn't. A, I hadn't been. A, I, we should talk a little. My software development. I, most of this time, I had not been doing coding, but. Like the more I was into it, the more like, you know, you go to the engineers and they can't do something and you, you, you want to understand in more depth uh, what, what it is. And then you're seeing different frameworks and things like that. So I quickly like started looking at different, like different ways that you could just tell you'd like go on Basecamp, which I loved. And you'd be like, this is a beautiful web application. And then you'd go on something just else that was like... That, yeah, built on Rails, and you'd go on something built on you know Microsoft a Microsoft platform, and it was terrible. And so then I like I went and I read the guys who built Rail, you know the guys who did Ruby on Rails was where Basecamp came out of Thirty Seven Signals. They wrote the book Getting Real. The fact that I was like in enterprise software and then like reading Getting Real was like everything that I like. It was like yeah, that's how you build software. That's how I had done it at Smart Restaurant. Like when it was me and another guy, we were just like, we would just iterate on things like that. Yeah, that agile, that iterative me. approach, Silicon Valley, ship fast. Like yeah. DHH is the person who built Ruby on Rails itself, which is what Basecamp mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, 37 Signals did. So yeah, yeah, very, very much kind of that contrarian mindset of yeah. ship and fast. It, fit, and it fits me, you know, like it's, 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 you know, of course, the the engineers I'd be working with probably would be rolling their eyes and like all this kind of stuff. But over time, you know, my predict, I mean, I, I, like I said, I, I had my MacBook. I wasn't going to use their stuff that like I would get in trouble with the, you know, the sys admins and the, the things, the IT department, but I, I didn't really care. And I was kind of working on my own and they just kind of, once you get branded as that, they, you know, maybe they just kind of let you do your thing. And I then got a project where I was able to, we actually built the back end on, on Ruby on Rails and Enterprise. We, they, we had this big customer that needed a new point of sale that was really stripped down. They wanted to replace 20,000 cash registers. This is Compass Group. They are like one of, they're like a Fortune 100 company. They run like, they're kind of like, they're as big as Aramark and Sodexo combined. They run like you know, uh, universities and, and corporate campuses and all their food services. And uh, they had, they were our biggest customer. This is, this was at Agilisys and they needed a system that would replace, they had all these cash registers that they would just pick up at like Costco or whatnot, but they couldn't get the data in and all this kind of stuff. But they were so easy to implement that it was like, do you really want this? Our point of sale system was like, incredibly difficult. I mean, it had like 800 like configuration settings. And if you, you know, if you needed to do this, you needed to switch flag, you know, flag 692 and flag 703. But if you did this other thing that it would cause this problem and it was like exactly what I wouldn't build in software. It's like no flags, the least amount of configuration, the most opinionated. And so they gave me this project to basically go after a compass group and build them a point Get of that sale. one contrarian crazy guy. He, he's he's going to be good at this. And they let me, they basically said, well, we don't have any Rails expertise. So you go out and go interview all the top Rails development shops. And I went around and, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm, now, I'm, now I'm blanking on some of the names. But some of these were, at the time, they, you know, they were like, 
I, they were, I was always following their blogs and things like that. We hired this company out of DC called Intridia. And they, that was really like my first introduction to a lot of what I've learned on how, what I take from product management today. Like they just had great process. I mean, they're a lot like Matter, um, just in terms of great product people, great design, everything kind of worked together. The way that they presented it to us, they went in, you know, to the, to, they went into the, uh, the client did interviews and user interviews and f really formal sit down interviews. And things that I had never really done, this weren't in my my tool set. Um, but so I, I learned, I, and I kind of knew that I was going to learn this too. I was like, okay, I, I, maybe I'm not working there, but I'll I'll like I can hire them and kind of just watch what they do, and then take that and and infuse that into our organization. And that's what happened. Uh, the the at the time there was my project, which was probably funded to the tune of about uh, two million dollars. And there was a the company, Agilisys, they had built a, they also had a, they were a point of sale system for restaurants and cruise ships, Compass Group and Royal Caribbean were two of their biggest customers. And then they also had a, like a hotel management solution that uh, they, many of the, like most of the big hotels in Las Vegas ran off of, but these are all really old clunky enterprise software. And they had spent $20 million to build a new version of this and it had taken them five years, and finally the new CEO came in, and they pulled the plug on the entire project. It never, it never launched. It like they never got five million it dollars waterfall development. Just twenty sunk. Off. Twenty. Oh, twenty. 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 20. Wow. And, and 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 so heads rolled, of course, right? Like I, I I watched this. It was like all these meetings were architect meetings and all this stuff, and I was just like. We were Meanwhile, just you have your $2 million budget, you're shipping fast, you're, you're building features. Yeah. We got to our pilot in six months, which they were like all stunned by. Um, the CEO would call me like nightly, be like, how, what's like, what's going on? They ended up, he ended were they up just promoting. confused? Like, did they understand what you were doing or was it just so foreign to them that they had no anchor? He understood. He understood what we were doing. Yeah. I mean, we, of course, we had a much lower, like, it wasn't like they, they, what they were trying to build. I don't, I don't know that I could build it. Like it's not, I'm not trying to like throw, like that's a much more complicated process than replacing a cash register in a cafeteria. And so it was the right, you know, but my, what I was saying to them is why don't we start here? Let's build the baseline here. And then we can add on to it over time, not start with your most complicated process and then think you can like, and then you got to get all these features out the door in, you know, year one, year two, year three. It's like, let's think in terms of months and what we can do. And so the project fit for that way of thinking. Um, I don't know that I could do a pro like people, people deliver projects like that, right? People build, people build Boeing. 7, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a project like that be delivered on budget on time, but sure, sure. Someone sure. out there can do waterfall really well. <laughs> so, some people, right? They're, they're, they're good at that. I, I'm not that type of person. I, like I, I, I'm more like, I want to be able to look over your shoulder, remember what are the things that, that are kind of d mentally discard the things I don't need, not be sitting there just filtering all, all the different things and have some kind of system, you know, uh, for all that. I, I like being able to just encapsulate all the things. So maybe take yeah. a, a quick segue in this this wonderful world of, of Pete's life. Um, and like that, which you just spoke about, of uh, being able to take in the information, sift through it, and then kind of discard what's not relevant currently. To me, that is product management. That is a big aspect of being able to do product management effectively. Because what you have is you have the stakeholders, right? You have the, the, the product owners, the client, the whoever, and they have an idea. And then they're gonna try to use words to describe that idea. And yeah. my understanding as product management is to facilitate the extraction of that. And you're going to get a lot of information. You're going to get, they're going to be talking about some feature or something that they thought about. And, oh, I like this thing over here. But you need to take that, filter out what is relevant and is not relevant to this moment, and then figure out a plan to actually go about and do it. So talk about that framework, that, that mindset. Like, how do you cultivate that? How do you do that? How do you do that effectively? I mean, I think that, one thing is you just, you, you get to a decision point and you don't go farther than kind of what you know. And the decision point 
can be validated when you go live. So like even just today, we're part 32. It was, a, it was a minor thing. It's like, do we, when we're clicking on a card, do we show, do we expand and show the amenities or do we have it, you know, shrunken down and then they, the user clicks on it and expands it? S simple thing, but it's like, we don't have to decide. Let's just, we, it's, it's just going to be a change. So it's like, when you know, you, when you know your, that software is agile and it's going to change, then don't try to lock, just try to make decisions and get to a point where you're not locked in on something, you know, don't dig into like trying to figure out some of those little questions, wait till you launch to figure those things out. So it, so don't be too committed to any one answer, be committed to getting it out there and know that some of the decisions you make are going to be wrong, but embrace that and, and make better decisions once you have better data. Get to the place where the users are using it and you're when you're making changes, it's because of direct user feedback. There's only if you try to do if you try to get all of that right in the research phase, you'll spend so much time in the research phase. So it's why like, is that so hard for people? Because oftentimes you'll hear about entrepreneurs that are stuck in analysis analysis paralysis, or maybe even entrepreneurs, and mm -hmm. they can just plan, 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 or engineers can build, build, build. But why is it counterintuitive or just hard to get in that agile, that true agile methodology of just shipping? Because you have to ship something that sucks. Like you have to be okay. And especially like, this is why like enterprise software is not good at that because everyone's sort of, you know, covering their ass and like, and so, but if the result, if what you're really going for is the result and, and people, you have time, you know, like you're, you're not going to launch and it's like, oh my gosh, this is, this isn't the way we like it. But you're, you show, you can show that we can make changes because you're not now locked in because you can, you can move quickly because you're not sitting there, you know, figuring out like, like just today, like, do I want to launch an app without like great, beautiful interactions and things? No, of course not. But I will for the pilot. Like, I don't, we don't care. I don't care. But the card just instantly disappear in one column and appear in another column. Like, move on from that. Like, we'll, we can fine tune those things. Um, especially if we're not, when we're doing the next thing, we're not getting locked into all those little details that like we have room in, in that sprint to kind of go back and, and, and do some of those things. I, I mean, I want a, a polished product. I, I think that comes from saying no to a lot of features, um, but not from having all the research, you know, up front. No, I think that's, I think that's really helpful because I think it's something that good product managers like yourself, you internalize it, but you also, sometimes it's easy to forget that that's a skill that's cultivated over time is that ability to accept something that's not what you want it to be because it's going to result in a better outcome. If, if you're able to say, let's make a decision, let's move forward, let's make sure it works and it's capable of doing the thing that it needs to do and validate. But in terms of the experience or the polish or all the things that you want, all the things that the client wants, we're going to acknowledge those but intentionally say no and not do them right now because it's actually going to result in a better product. Yeah. And you know, shipping can cover shipping quickly covers a lot of mistakes. Like people like there, I, you know, I think from my enterprise software experience and having seen like $20 million projects, like go nowhere, um, you realize like get this thing out the door, get it being used. The, people will forgive a lot of, you know, mistakes in the software if they see that it's launched because there's that relief that the money that went in and the time that went in, it got you something. So get there is try to get there as quickly as possible for get it's a win for it's possible. a win for everybody. And then it makes it so much easier to figure out what to do next. Makes a lot of sense. So you ship in six months, your rails project, you're now starting to live the DHH life, the, the, yeah. the agile methodology. How does that go? Where do you go from there? They, they, they promoted me to the, um, to the director of software development, even though I was not, not I really hadn't. So it went like well. the CEO was like, what's, what's going well? Like, oh my God, this is like the only thing that isn't like a flaming wreck, uh, <laughs> like promote this guy. <laughs> and it, it was always like a, I, I, it was a promotion and I was like, I don't want to be doing this like long-term. 
And honestly, I, I don't even feel like it went that well. Like when, you know, you they march you in and everybody else, I mean, these people are doing what they're doing is difficult. And then, you know, you come in with your toy application and you're supposed to tell them all how to like their Microsoft dev shop. They're not switching 70 engineers, you know, um, so everyone hates off, you. Yeah, basically not, maybe not personally, but not personally, uh, just what but, you represent. You know, Definitely like fish out of water. Definitely still didn't really have nearly the technical chops for that role. I think I'd be more comfortable in it today. Also working remote, managing almost 80 people total. There was like 70 in the engineering, uh, uh, like 10 in product and business, business analysts and a very aloof executive team based in Atlanta. I lived in San Diego office in Santa Barbara, Las Vegas, Seattle, and Atlanta. And I'm on a, I'm living like the, you know, I got all of the lounge passes and all the statuses and the airlines and the, all the stuff. I also I put on like 40 pounds. I was like the heaviest I'd ever been totally living the corporate America, like life. Um, Happy, neutral, miserable, pretty miserable actually. Yeah. Marriage not going so well. Um, and, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll skip through some things, but basically sure. the, the company, the, the CEO had come out of, uh, of, of, uh, a company that they had sold to Microsoft and his CTO had been at Microsoft with golden handcuffs and those golden handcuffs get unlocked. He hires him on as a CTO. He opens up the office in Seattle and starts hiring a VP of, of engineering who's now my boss. And then they hire a new director of engineering and they'll kind of put me, change my title around who's now my boss. And then like eventually I found, I, it was like the writing was on the wall. I wasn't going to move to Seattle. I didn't like these guys really at all. And uh, I, Basically, they just kept relegating to me where I had almost nothing to do. And I, I basically, I was doing nothing. And then, you know, they let me go. And I was like, thank God. And, uh, and then I kind of, that kind of, that was a time in my life. It was a big shift in my life. I went through a divorce. I literally like sold the BMW, moved out of the house, moved into a shack in my, my parents' friend's garden and like did uber for like uh for like a year uh just body surfing and doing yoga every day and running like got in the best shape of my life like kind of and then from that place i started a business called checkwise which was a food safety application i had been i'd come across this solution when i was at um par and agilisys and it was like a there was companies that were doing these like in these food service like Walmart, Whole Foods and their in the grocery stores and other big chains, they had they would take their checklists, their food safety checklists and put them all on a handheld, a Windows CE handheld. And then you'd sync it in the back office and that would sync to a database. And then they could see like all of the temperature checks across their enterprise and like basically make sure that the employees were doing all the checks that they were supposed to do. And I thought, aha, I have a friend who's an iPhone developer and I have a friend who's a Rails developer. And we went and bootstrapped this company called Checkwise. And uh, we basically built this application. Um, we got it into a pilot with Carl's Jr. Um, we got into a pilot with Whole Foods, um, did pretty well. And this was this, this during this transformational time. And I, right when it was about to take off, I was kind of weighing, taking investment. And I just decided that I didn't want to work with like fast food restaurants and all You're this stuff. And I was like, yeah, I was over it. And so I called up a friend who worked at a, a point of sale company and I convinced them that they should buy this software because it was, would be like a great add on to their point of sale. Like get, you know, most restaurants don't change point of sale, but every seven years. And so my pitch was you guys can, you have basically a stuffing, a stocking stuffer for all these restaurants. You can go in and start building a relationship and give them the solution. 
And there's nobody who has a solution like this, and it'll give you sort of an entryway into uh, when you need to make the make the relationship and you want to make the point of sale. You know, you want to you want to go in and, and sell the point of sale system. So I I, I basically got my money out of it, and uh, I I I I took off, and I I decided that I wanted to actually learn how to code. And so I, I, I did a, uh, a, mo a mobile boot camp, an iOS mobile boot camp called Mobile Makers in Chicago for three months, which was awesome. I was probably like the oldest person in the cohort. I think I was like, this would have been 2013. So I was like 39 at the time and I had experience in tech and there was like all, you know, uh, people mostly in their tw in their 20s and early 30s and stuff. and. I just loved it. I got to mentor, like I got to mentor young people who are just starting off in technology. I got to code every day. I was like studying. I was like coding till like midnight and then, you know, coming back. What was and, the, the translation like between being in product for so long and having tons of experience with technology and software, but to actually dip into being technical and writing code? Was it hard? Was it easy? You said you, it sounds like you liked it. Yeah. Yeah, I liked it. Um, no, I don't think it was, it, I don't think it was, it was too hard. I mean, I think that there's a little bit of, uh, because, well, partly in the boot camp, you, you're thinking up your own projects and doing them. So that part you already have. And like, I already under, I had already been involved in sort of technology decisions, like which framework should we use or like different components. And so like doing, you know, mobile development, yes, you got to learn, you got to learn, um, iOS development. It wasn't Swift yet. It was Objective C at the time. This was right before Swift came out. And uh, but there's still you still have to use other things like APIs and things like that. And I already was familiar with those and had been dabbling in that, but never really knew like how to code. You know, like I just I knew all these things and I kind of understood what it meant, but I wanted to like really understand it. And so for me, it was like. I had been waiting for years to do this. I had spent time learning Ruby on Rails, so I learned. I learned Ruby on Rails. I went through the Why the Lucky Stiffs uh, guide to Ruby, and like, like loved love Ruby on Rails, especially in the early days. Um, but I I didn't have the time to really like to spend. And I think what I learned from coding is, even though you obviously it's not about memorization. There, it is a lot about muscle memory and just doing doing it over and over again and that type of learning. So, yeah, that was like my first my first experience with that. And uh, I I kind of wish I had learned web development. I think I would have there, like I would have gone in more directions because I quickly like building a building a mobile app is all just is all front end. And I yep. I actually I actually like the back end a little bit more. I find it kind of more interesting um, than getting, you know, you you have to spend so much. It's like you end up spending so much time on the look of something and, and layout and all that kind of stuff, which is not. It doesn't really engage me all that much. You um, like data but, and systems. Yeah. How things yeah. work. Mm -hmm. So you teach yourself to code. You've gone on this kind of long journey. Where where do you end up? Kind of close out the story because I want to make sure we also have time sure. for. AI and zero knowledge proofs and kind of everything else. <laughs> that might have to be about. part. That might have to be part two. Fair enough. Um, so basically, I I come back to San Francisco. I'm thinking I'm going to get a job coding. I have I have a few interviews. They go pretty well. I do a bunch of technical interviews. It's going to definitely be like you know a junior dev position, um, not great salary when you have alimony to pay, and. Uh, I get this job offer from this company in San Francisco called Vendini as a, for a product position. And it is, they are starting a, they had just acquired a, a festival solution, like a, a festival logistics solution, it, actually a company who had built this whole software and they're going to rewrite the whole thing. And they want it to be like basically self like customer serving. So right now it was like their internal team was using this solution that they had built. And they're going to hire me. The development team is going to be in Italy and I'm going to go around to all their music festivals. They have Bonnaroo, Electric Forest, Coachella, like in a whole slew of smaller festivals and work with the ops team and build them like their dream operational software using the current software that they have as the template. 
um, get to choose to build it on, on whatever platform I want. I went with React at the time. This was in 2014, early there too. Good choice. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was the, the engineering team there wanted it to be Angular and I fought them tooth and nail on it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I kind of, but the downside was I, I kind of let go of my coding dreams because I, I didn't, I wasn't doing it anymore. And I was just having too much fun, honestly, like uh, going out, they would send me to festivals with an all access pass and a golf cart and a walkie talkie. And I was with the ops team and usually I was jumping, I would just jump on and do what they were doing, but I didn't have the actual responsibilities either. So I could wander and go anywhere in the festival. So I, I would spend my summer at the end of the summer, then they would fly me to Italy to Gualdo Tadino, which is like two and a half hours Northeast of Rome. And uh, this little town that it's like, it just looks like you're nestled in the foothills of Santa Barbara there. It's like the exact same climate. And they got me a scooter in an apartment and we had a whole office. Uh, the, 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 this company had started, the, the founder of this company in San Francisco had a cousin, had a, a nephew who was an engineer and they had this great little pipeline from this engineering university in Italy and would hire developers that were like a third of the cost of developers in San Francisco. And they had continuity, they didn't leave or go anywhere because they had this great job in the middle of, middle of nowhere in Italy. And so I'd spent, I'd spend like three months uh, flying around to festivals and then like two months in Italy. And so like, I, I kind of just, take. yeah, I was just kind of cruising, you know, doing and doing what I love. Like I, I love building operational software. Like I knew the ops people really well. So if like, if the software didn't work well, it wasn't going to be a good festival. And I was there if it did go well then they'd love you and everything was great. So, you know, it's like, that's a great motivator. Uh, for building things when you have, you're actually going to experience, you know, how it works or doesn't work. What was the coolest uh, festival that you went to? Uh, the coolest festival that I went to, I mean, Bliss Fest was really high up there. Um, I, I like my, I Bliss Fest is, or sorry, not Bliss Fest is my favorite, but the other one is Electric Forest, which is also in Michigan. These are two Michigan festivals. The first electric force is like, you know, 15,000 people, uh, Odessa playing, uh, it, the string cheese plays every year. That's like the main band. Uh, my, my nephew who I had never met is from Michigan. My, my mom grew up in Michigan. I met him there one day and I, I got him and all his friends, like all access passes to everything. And then ended up doing mushrooms with him and all his friends. They were all like 19. I'm like 41 or something. I, hanging out. I got the golf cart. You're like that take... cool, crazy uncle with all the access yeah. and all the hookups. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that was a, that was, a, that was a pretty big highlight. And my alt my favorite festival, which I still have a relationship with is bliss fest. And I just love the people love the music. It's a really small festival. It's like, Four or five thousand. It's been going on. Uh, people. It's been going on for like forty years, and they um, they invited me to come back and help them run their. So they don't have Vendini as their their ticketing provider anymore. Uh, but uh, two years ago, they invited me to come back. Or it was, it was last year. It was the first year and run their their gate their main gate. So I came back and did that. I also came back on my own with, with my partner and our daughter, who was about one, one at the time. We were doing a van trip across to Nova Scotia, and we stopped at Bliss Fest. And so I have a lot of friend, friendships there and, like, and have went back and ran the gate last year with all new software, but, like, super fun. It's just, like, it's like you, ha you know, there's giant lines and so many things going on, and it's a, it's a fun environment to be in. So, That's awesome. so those you, are my you two touched, favorite. You touched on uh, a van trip. Maybe, maybe also touch on that the, a little bit. Van. I've heard some some van stories. It's, I guess, you could take the uh, the American vagabond out of his twenties, but he's still an American vagabond. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I've had a couple like retirement periods in my life. One was when I was doing the Uber driving and body surfing and yoga. Um, when I finished with. Um, when I finished with Vendini, finally, um, I, I ended up buying a, a camper van because I wanted to go to, I have, I've always had this interest in like off-grid building and natural building. 
and I wanted to go do, they have this academy in Taos, New Mexico, the Earthship Academy. Earthships, for people that don't know what those are, they're like these fully autonomous homes off grid. They basically, they're, they're meant to, pro, they, they provide all the needs a human has on the planet. They heat and cool you, they grow food so they can feed you, they deal with your waste, they produce electricity, they collect water. So the idea being an earthship, meaning if you have an earthship and it has all these systems that it can provide all these things for you. And what's really interesting, it's, it's sort of like permaculture or stacking functions. The fact that you have all these systems, the house works because it does all the things that the, the occupant needs. And if you take any one of those systems out, the other things, they kind of fall, they don't have that other thing to lean on. So it's a really beautiful system. Um, and I was always uh, and fascinated by it. Also to chime in there on earthships, beautiful is definitely an operative word. So it's not kind of this super functional thing that looks ugly. They're super functional, off grid and beautiful. I highly yeah. recommend Google it yeah. or go watch a YouTube video on it. They are breathtaking in terms of their architecture. Some of the, some of the systems that people have built and it's, it's self-sustaining, totally. which just makes it even totally, better. totally agree. And I, uh, interestingly enough, they didn't provide housing during the, during this thing. And like, it was all like, oh, go, you can stay here and it all seemed expensive. And I thought, I'm just going to buy a camper van. And my, my, my partner, Milena had a friend who had had a camper van and settled down in Portland. She was living in Portland at the time and he was selling it and they had, put a compost toilet in and put solar on it and inverter. It's a, it's a 98 road trek. I still have it. And, uh, I was thinking I was going to build out a van and all this stuff and I'm not really that handy. So I like, I just bought this thing and it's been awesome. It like, basically it's, you know, uh, it has 30 gallon water tank, full kitchen, king size bed in the back. It's a 20 foot, it's the biggest of, you know, this would have been top of the line RV when, when it first came out, like these camper vans. Um, it's built on a, it's like a Chevy 3500 chassis diesel. Um, but it like, I have had this thing now since 2017 and I've done trips all the way across to Nova Scotia to Baja. I love it because we never make reservations. It's always just like, where are we going to go? Where are we going to sleep tonight? Like, can I sneak in here? I'll like, I'll even find like places to sneak in and the national parks, they make you make reservations for the campgrounds and stuff. I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. So I, I just like find the places uh, I have like little, little tricks, you know, like I pull in between if there's, if we are going to stay at a campground and there's like people already there, like park kind of between two spots. So nobody really knows like who you're with or, or whatnot, you know, and then you're out in the morning. You're just like trying to find a, a place to lay your head at night. Selling pirated cruise. software in the dot com boom <laughs> to uh, hacking, being the only Mac user when everyone else is using Windows, kind of being the deviant there. To what were some of the other hacking things that you did? To, to literally jailbreaking <laughs> iPhones, hacking, right? Well, we're following the scripts on YouTube's. And then uh, van hacking in terms of going going off script and and off reservation those are the those are the only ones i can mention without in, incriminating myself <laughs> <laughs> i like it we'll have to, we'll have to bring you on and, and uh bring some drinks or something to, to explore more on that so pete i want to i know we, we're kind of running out of time here so in terms of the journey you've been on the product journey experiencing technology through mm. so many pivotal inflection points starting with the internet, the iPhone cloud, which we didn't really get into, and then kind of this, this next wave of diving deeper in technology. What ultimately is motivating you in all of this and where do you ultimately want to go? Like what, what is still driving you? What are you curious about? What are you hungry for? Yeah, I mean, I, I will say, so when I went out to do the Earthship Academy, my thinking was, um, you know, I was in San Francisco. This was in like 2000. Um, set, yes, 2017, it just felt like technology was starting to get really stale for me. It was like, everything is like a mobile app. It's like Uber for dry cleaning or Uber for this or Uber for that. And it was just kind of, kind of boring and not like things that I use. Like I don't, I, I, I'll ride my bike before I like, I, like scooters coming out is not like, 
I love technology for how disruptive it can be, but I also like not having technology. Like my, I mean, I built point of sale systems for restaurants, but my point of sale for my restaurant would be like a chalkboard and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, flat rate pricing and cash only. Like, so I, I, like I'm more into the systems and when technology can slipstream and make those systems better then I'm all for it. But when it's just like, well, we'll put all these sensors here and like, and it just becomes like the people become a slave to the technology and having to do whatever it wants. No, but if it's empowering you to do more, then I love it. So I was kind of out. I was like, I'm going to go build houses out of tires in the desert and earthships. And I was out there and that organization, the earthship organization, very, um, very amazing ideals uh, for many, many people in it. But it's also like centered around like this one guy who's had these great ideas. And it's a very, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Just it, it, not a great organization. It, it had all the hallmarks of some of the, um, you know, s- some of the startups I had worked for that had just really bad dynamics with leadership and things like that. And I, I was like, man, like these things, these systems, like they keep like one person kind of owns them. And I'm a big believer in open source software. And when I was out there, uh, a buddy of mine was like, he's like, go read the Ethereum white paper. Cause I had, I had knew about Bitcoin for a long time. I always followed like, uh, um, I always followed like all the different, you know, hacker news and, and back in the slash dot back in the day. And, and so like, I mean, I was aware of Bitcoin, like the Bitcoin paper when it first came out, like probably within a couple of weeks and never really spent the time to understand it, which I wish I had. But finally in 2017, um, my friend was like, go read the Ethereum white paper. And I read it and I read it a couple times. And then it was like all, it was like this kind of like when I saw the web for the first time, but in a very different way, this is not really about technology. It's more about like organization ways to organize things using technology. But the, really the impact is the way you organize things. And I, I saw it right away. It was like open table, like, well, here was this thing. It was like open table, all the restaurants that used open table, they hated it. Like they, they used it and they liked it. It worked okay. But the fee structure and all this stuff, it was like it, they got captured by this software company and now they had to use the software. And it always bugged me because it was like, yeah, the people, they cashed in their IP when they IPO'd and then it's left with a bunch of people that aren't really passionate about it. All the people that were passionate about it that started it leave because they cash out. I was like, this is not a good model for long term. And then the idea of public goods in blockchain and all that stuff just clicked with me, DAOs, like the, those things clicked with me really early. And I was looking at, you know, these new types of building structures. And I was thinking, yeah, like this would be, these are public goods too. Like how could we open source these designs, have public goods uh, funding for them? So that's kind of always been, that's my main interest in in crypto, really. I mean, I, I don't, it's not really crypto that is decentralized it, systems is and, the decentralized yeah. systems and crypto and these blockchains are just these examples of it. And I think are still I, one of the most impactful technologies we will see in combination with AI. And I think the two are actually going to kind of start to combine, but blockchain and that whole idea is what brought me back into technology. So I went out to New Mexico, built some ships went back, started drinking from the fire hose of blockchain, not even realizing how much I didn't understand, went and got a job as a product manager for an early startup building. Um, At the time, they were building an API marketplace um, uh, on the blockchain. Um, But that was like, that was it. They kind of raised a bunch of money on a napkin and had no other idea, which was fine. And we ended up pivoting and building like an auth solution um, for DAP dap developers they made this terrible decision to move to the eos blockchain from ethereum um because they were like oh you you know like and they were like they weren't diehard the people that were in this company they weren't really diehard blockchain they were it was more like they saw an opportunity and they were just going for it they they weren't really they, they weren't aware of how early it was and how experimental it needed to be at that time they thought they could commercialize it now um, and that was a kind of a battle that we had. I, I was only there for about a year. I told them about six months in that it wasn't going to work, but I also really liked the team and we delivered really great software. And so I spent 
six months kind of transitioning my self out just because we were like a six person team and I love the people I work with. It was great. So, but I was like, mm, not going in the direction I want. Um, but it was like, I got to meet tons of people in the blockchain space. I got to just basically drink from the fire hose and like, you know, learn all the things I didn't understand about, um, about, about blockchain. And then um, the pandemic hit, I had a daughter and I took, Man, I think before I, I took the job with Matter, I had almost a two, I had like a two year hiatus. I basically didn't work throughout the, the pandemic. I, I did code. I started coding a lot. I started doing JavaScript and React and like, and then, uh, and that's when, and then I, that's when I found Matter. I think that is probably a perfect pausing point for between part one and part two. Coming up in part two, we will talk more about Zero Knowledge Proofs, uh, DAOs, AI. I think AI, Pete, you and I have talked a lot about where this goes from a long-term perspective. and uh, But that's definitely a, a whole conversation unto itself. So in the meantime, if people want to look you up or connect with you or, or chat with you, where do they find you? Uh, LinkedIn slash Pete McCarthy. Um, yeah, that's it. I don't have a big social media presence, so... That's probably the best place to find me is on is on LinkedIn, yeah. Or cram between two vans in a national park. <laughs> hours of, uh, or in, pa and in Paonia, in Paonia, Colorado. <laughs> Those would be the options. Pete, any any yeah. final words you want to leave uh, leave our listeners with? Uh, no, I'm off to do some yoga. Remember to remember to move. Remember to breathe. Uh, remember to surround yourself with loved ones. I love it. Thanks for coming on, Pete. All right. Thanks, Elijah.